really what I want to do today is, is, is show some of the things that are happening in architecture and high-rise architecture around the world. Before we do that, I normally start with some data and some statistics on global trends in tall buildings. And actually, um, you know, as, as we all know, last week was the, the weekend was the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And so actually the next few slides I'm going to show you, I've not shown anybody yet. This is the first time I'm showing you, but I just want to start with a quote if you'd like to read this. The age of skyscrapers is at an end. It must now be considered an experimental building typology that has failed. And I put that up to remind ourselves, or maybe not remind if you're not aware of this, but in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, many people, including in my industry, architects and engineers, believed that it would be the death of tall buildings. And people would not be comfortable living in, working in, recreating, basically occupying high-rise buildings. Um, and that's kind of relevant today because recently, in the last year or two, a similar thing has happened as a response to COVID and the, and the pandemic. It's like buildings are unsafe. Um, we will not see a return to office, possibly not even see a return to the city. You know, we, we, maybe the suburb is better than the city. So I throw that up there to, to, to start the, the conversation. And 84% of all high-rise buildings over the height of 200 meters, which is a fairly high threshold, 686 feet. 84% 80 80 of all those buildings in the entire world existing today have been built since 9-11. So that statistic that 9-11 would be the death of tall buildings, actually, the exact opposite is true. And maybe we can get into this a little later if, if you're interested, but actually I think 9-11 ended up being a catalyst for tall buildings rather than an inhibitor. And we talk about why that is later. Some other statistics. So if we look at different height thresholds, so that was 200 meters and above. This is, this is the height threshold of 300 meters, which is important because it, it's what we define as a super tall building. And I'm not going to go into that in detail, but that's something that uh, the body that I lead, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, we uh, set the title of the world's tallest building and the criteria on which tall buildings is measured. So super tall is 300 and above. So again, you can see it's a similar story, 86% of those buildings. If we look at the very tallest end, this is the history of the world's tallest building, which started in Chicago in 1886, and today, that title resides in uh, Dubai with the Burj Khalifa, which is 828 meters tall. So you can see their World Trade Center, fifth from the right, sixth from the right, um, and, and you can see the height of buildings that have happened since then. Of the 100 tallest buildings in the world, again, 86 of them have been built. And really, to put this into context on an annual basis, in the decade before 9-11, in the 1990s, the entire world was typically building 12 buildings per year greater than 200 meters. Last decade, that was 112 buildings every year. You know, almost a six-fold increase. Eight of the 10 tallest buildings in the U.S. You know, and 9-11 had ripple effects. It had the biggest impact in the U.S. and it had ripple effects all around the world. But eight of the 10 current tallest buildings in the U.S. have been built since 9-11. The only two on that list that predate 9-11 is Sears Tower, sorry, Willis Tower here in Chicago and, uh, and the Empire State Building. By the way, the, the original World Trade Center towers, if they were still alive today, would be uh, 31st and 32nd tallest in the world. It's not that long ago since they were the tallest in the world. And this is a graph that shows um, where these tall buildings are located. And the dark blue here is America, is North America. Uh, the light blue is Asia um, and, and the Middle East. So you can see what's happened. The majority of, 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 of these tall buildings at the taller end, super tall buildings especially, um, there's been a huge shift from North America to Asia and the Middle East. That does not mean we're not building tall buildings in the US. 
And this, this chart here shows that actually, you know, in the decade 91 to 2001, the US was typically building one of these buildings per year, and that's um, now about six per year. So it's not saying that we're not building tall buildings in the US. We are. You know, it's the same kind of statistics. They're just not building them at the absolute tallest, super tall end. Um, because the dialogue around the world's tallest and the motivations for the world's tallest has moved on to Asia and the Middle East. And to be quite frank, it doesn't stack up here financially. And, and most things here are driven by the market. Most architecture is driven by the market and the market doesn't stack up. Okay. So, um, okay, so that's what's been happening around the world in terms of massive numbers of tall buildings being built. Why has it been happening? So let's look at the drivers and the influencing factors. So the first one, it's always been a driver for tall buildings, always will be, land price and return on investment. A developer can get a lot more financial return, 60 stories on a, on a, on a site than six stories. Driver two, the appetite for global icons. And what this means is that many cities around the world believe that they need a skyline to be taken seriously. Uh, the last three, four tall buildings, and I'm pretty sure all those that are going to, the, the world's tallest buildings, it's been very explicit that they were built to put Dubai on the map, to put Kuala Lumpur on the map, to put Taipei on the map. And you can actually see it in the titles of the buildings. These, these buildings typically used to be called Chrysler Tower, Sears Tower. They were about a corporation um, really saying to itself, okay, we can get all our people in one office building and if we you know, design something beautiful and if we call it Sears Tower, then we get free branding. Well, the exact same thing is happening. It's just now countries are doing it. Countries and cities are doing it. They're competing with each other by you know, designing and building these super tall, iconic buildings. Not necessarily a good thing, by the way. Come back to that. So, so number one, financial. Number two, this quest for global icons and the, this feeling that to be taken seriously as a first world city, you need high rise buildings and you need a skyline. Driver number three, population growth. This graph shows it all. There's just a heck of a lot more people on the planet. Where do we put them all? And that's linked to this graph, which is one of my favorite graphs. And by the way, I'm not gonna talk about data all night, but if you only remember one piece of data that I tell you tonight, to go home and tell your children or your partners or whatever, just please remember this, because it's the most important data, really. United Nations statistics show that there are one million people urbanizing on this planet every week. One million people moving into cities or being born into cities every week. So we as a species that inhabit this planet need to build Chicago every month. The equivalent of Chicago to cope with this urban migration. So the next question is, well, where do all these people go? Um, by the way, the countries where that is predominantly happening, this huge um, urbanization and population migration, you know, in descending order, China, India, Indonesia, Turkey, Brazil, and many other countries which, which would perhaps be classed as the developing world. But it's not just the developing world. You know, and this graph here shows what's happening in the US. The US predicts a 0.7% per annum population growth, um, which is 228,000 people more per year and they're not all conveniently being distributed equally throughout the US. Actually there's, a, there's, a, there's another migration going on in the US which is from Rust Belt to Sun Belt such that places like Dallas and other cities are seeing a net migration gain of 52,000 people per year. Where do those people go? So it's the same thing that's happening in China and India and other places, it's just a different scale. On top of that, we have changing social demographics. And the way I like to describe this is, people don't like each other as much as they used to. Divorce rate is up, single family households, uh, there's more need for them, and various other social dynamics, which is also affecting the need for, for accommodation. And driving, 
driving tall buildings, driving buildings, driving tall buildings. But the key one, which goes back to the population growth and urbanization, is really about urban density, because the American model of, 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 of cities has really been about a dense downtown working core with a horizontal, ever-expanding suburb to support a dense downtown. Um, well, in the context of a million people urbanizing every week, if the world does that, we're not going to exist on this planet for that much longer, to be quite frank. There's just not the space and the energy it takes to, first of all, create a city in that way, but then to operate the city, to run the infrastructure, the linear infrastructure to, to, um, to support that city. The commute to and from work is completely unsustainable. So certainly in our organization, we believe that cities need to densify and develop in a, you know, in a denser way. And so that means some element of verticality. But I'm going to come back to what type of verticality in a minute. This is another of my favorite graphs. This shows the relationship between urban density and energy efficiency, energy consumption, predominantly in transport, um, but it doesn't really matter. It, you know, it's, 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 it's that relationship to urban density and, and energy. And you will see on the bottom right there, one of the most sustainable cities on the planet is Hong Kong. Now, I lived in Hong Kong for several years, and I'll tell you why Hong Kong is sustainable, and I'll tell you what is the difference between sustainable cities and unsustainable cities. It's very simple. It's infrastructure. It's all about infrastructure. So in Hong Kong, for example, if you, when you step outside your door, if you want to go for a pint of milk or whatever, you have a plethora of transport options. Anything that has one or more wheel is probably a form of public transport. You've got above ground trains, below ground trains, on ground trains, you've got trams, taxis, boats. You can walk for miles without touching the ground on Skybridge networks. You can walk below ground. Rickshaws, as opposed to Houston, and I apologize if anyone's from Houston, or a lot of American cities where if you want a pint of milk in the evening, then your choice is to walk two, three miles or get in a car and drive. So that's what makes cities sustainable. We can clad all the buildings we want in solar panels and all these things, and we actually do need to do that, but it's about, it's about the infrastructure and it's about the collective benefits of urban density. So really, that's what you know, we're interested in, that's what I'm interested in. How do cities evolve? On the left there, is it about urban density or on the right, the horizontal model? Okay, let's get on to the subject more of this, of this evening, which is about so, the social aspects and, uh, and community. So, um, so I'm the CEO of the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. I'm also a professor of architecture at IIT, the home of Mies van der Rohe. We're in one fantastic masterpiece of one modern icon here, and I work in Crown Hall, you know, a, 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 another modernist icon. Uh, so you would expect me to be totally rah, 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 tall buildings. Tall buildings are brilliant. I think that 95% of tall buildings that exist today are terrible pieces of design. I don't think they're great in any way. I call it the shortfall of tall, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because they're usually designed one of two ways. This is the first way. Um, and, and if you're not aware of this building, and it's controversial that I would put this up coming from IIT, but this is Mies van der Rohe's uh, Seagram building in New York. Um, by the way, in 1958, this was totally revolutionary. Fantastic. Okay, we're 70 years on. Seriously, go down to any city and look at the tall buildings and ask yourself if they moved on much from that. They are the same commercially driven rectilinear box. The envelope, the facade might have got a little bit more efficient, that's Patrick's Field facades, but there's still this rectilinear, highly efficient box, which is really just about making the most financial return. So even in Chicago, you can see this box replicated, you know, throughout the city. So that's shortfall number one, commercially driven. I'll be frank with you, I'm not even sure it's architecture. If ar architecture is creating commercial space and cladding it in a, you know, relatively cheap skin, then okay, it's architecture, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's architecture. 
Now, here's, here's the second design approach, the iconic sculptural design approach. And, and this is tall buildings get designed as pieces of sculpture, right? And, and literally, they are designed like any other piece of sculpture, on a sculptor's table almost, and then they are superimposed onto a city. And the relationship between the building and the city is a purely visual one. It's really a relationship that says, hey, I'm beautiful, behold me. I'm beautiful, behold me. And then next door, there's another one saying, no, I'm beautiful, behold me, I'm beautiful, behold me. You know, it's just this game of icons which actually end up self-canceling out because it's crazy because this becomes this. <laughs> this is a real proposal, by the way. This was the, the, the financial crash, crash of uh, the late, God, I can't remember what that was, 10 years ago. The last uh, financial crash, crash put this to, to bed, but, but these are real proposals. And, um, and I ask you, is this a city or is it, is, it, is it a zoo? It's a menagerie, isn't it? No, it's just a zoo of these competing icons. And here's the ultimate perversity. These, these tall buildings are being, you know, supplanted on cities around the world that might have thousands of years of vernacular tradition in architecture. You know, it, and, I mean, I got a one-way ticket out to Hong Kong when I was 21, and before I was 30, I'd traveled across all seven continents and 60 countries. I'd worked in Hong Kong, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and I did that because I was driven by this passion for foreign travel, for cu foreign culture, because I'm interested in the difference between culture, not the similarities. You know, I think the differences between culture is something to preserve, and you know, the local societies is something to preserve and, and, you know, and recognize. And unfortunately, architecture is doing for cities what Starbucks and McDonald's is doing for the dining experience. It's all becoming homogenized. It's becoming homogenized. And so we look at, you know, city, the skylines of cities are all becoming the same. Predominantly commercial boxes with a few, you know, crazy icons. Um, Please do not make the mistake of thinking because you can, because a skyline or a building becomes synonymous with a place. I like, you recognize, ah, that's Sydney. I know, yeah, I know, I, that building's in Sydney. I recognize Sydney. Doesn't mean that it was actually born of that place. Um, you know, so, so this homogenization of cities is, 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 is not a great thing. And what we see is, you know, we will see maybe a design competition, let's say in Moscow, um, and, and for high-rise high buildings, and maybe one gets chosen, and then the other four or five ones that don't get chosen, they'll pop up again a few years later in a competition in Shenzhen, China, or Toronto, or Chicago. Because again, the relationship is a purely visual one. It's a purely... I am here to behold. So the synonymous thing, if, you, if it becomes synonymous with Dubai, but to be quite honest, it becomes synonymous with, you know, Baku, Azerbaijan or wherever, if you would put it there. That's not architecture. We travel around the world. If you look at architectural form around the world, it's all different. You know, the Chinese pagoda, the, the Islamic mosque, the Western cathedral, tribal houses in Africa, they all look different. They all look different. The reason they look different is because the inspiration, the, the, res the architectural response has to be different because they've got to work with local materials, the local climate, local society, the physical things going on. And to be quite frank, that went out the window globally with 1950s modernism, in my view, because a lot of modernism believed in the universal architecture, the work of Mies van der Rohe and, uh, and others. So this is one of my favorite images. I want to take you back almost 500 years uh, to a place called Shibam in Yemen. And I want you to just look at that city, 500 years old, yeah? There are no two buildings the same there. And that was in both incredibly high and incredibly dense when they built that city. There are no, you know, there are no two buildings the same, but there are none of these self-sanctified icons popping out. There's a, there's a commonality, there's a beauty, there's a harmony of material, of approach. By the way, 
There's narrow streets because in the hot, hot desert, you don't want a six lane highway that no one's gonna walk, walk down. So, so we kind of used to know how to do things in a human way, and we've kind of lost the ability to do it now. Um, you know, the other side of this as well, if, 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 if you're not clear that I'm, I'm pretty critical of a lot of tall buildings, is the social equity um, part of it. So I, re I remember when I arrived here 15 years ago from the UK, at that time, tall buildings were extremely controversial in London. They'd, they'd recently built the Swiss Re, the Gherkin, you might know that building, and, and by the way, that's now, it's on every London um, promotional campaign for the Olympics or whatever, because the people love it. They love the Gherkin. It's become, that's become absorbed into the conscience of the, of the city, but it was hugely controversial when they built it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the buildings they've built since then are not of the high quality, I think, of the Gherkin. But I remember arriving in the US, and then a debate was raging. The ra debate was raging here about the Chicago Spire. Do you remember that project, Cal Calatrava? Um, and then the debate moved on to rage about New York. Uh, and it was the same debate in London about these buildings being completely out of scale and inappropriate. New York! You know, New York's got hundreds of buildings of, you know, of ma massive height. The reason is because a lot of these towers were even taller, they were um, extremely slender, they're right on the edge of um, Central Park, there was all these other side issues about casting shadows in, in Central Park, but the main criticism really, which I think is a valid criticism, is that they were being built for the ultra-rich, I don't just mean the rich, I mean, the, I mean, you know, don't even come and look in an apartment if you can't buy it off planet $30 million. And the problem is this, the, the apartments are being built, being um, bought largely as safety deposit boxes from people overseas, you know, who have a lot of money, but, but, but their own economy or their own, whether it's Dubai or other places, is not necessarily stable to invest, so they're buying this real estate. So it means that these buildings are being built at massive height in a huge impact on the city, and nobody lives there. Maybe they come for two weeks of the year. Because let me tell you if you can if you can afford to buy an apartment for 30 million dollars you're probably not that interested in renting it out on airbnb when you're not there you're not are you so these towers are like having a huge impact on the city but they're not they're not addressing the concerns that i rose at the beginning the the, the drivers about uh, about population growth and the need for more accommodation so, okay, so maybe all that's a bit negative and, and, and you're all a little bit depressed. Um, so now, let's look at some good things. If I think that 95% of tall buildings are terrible, I want to show you some of the 5%. But there's a, there's a, so I'm going to show you 10 or, 10 or 15 projects. And then I'm going to show you some of my student work. Now I'm going to really show you how we do it. But, um, but there's one thing that ties these projects together the 10 or 15 projects I'm gonna show you. And I want you to think about this, because th this, is, this is relevant in Oak Park as well. And this gets onto the societal part of this, uh, of the, the, the topic that we're talking about tonight that I'm presenting on. All of them take on a responsibility that's bigger than the building. They give something back to the city, to the community, not just maximum financial return for the developer. So, one, the, so I could have showed you lots and lots of projects that incorporate vegetation into, into, the, uh, into the building. Um, I chose one in, in Santiago, Chile. Um, we need to start to build our cities out of vegetation. I'm not even talking about just putting green walls there. We need to start to bring vegetation into the city and start to build the city out of vegetation, not just steel and, and glass. The science behind this is proven. You know, the science, the psychological benefits, people perform better in natural environments. We're animals. The sequestering of carbon, the cleaning of atmosphere, the, the creation of habitat for insect and there's 20 benefits scientifically proven of, of, of the benefits of bringing vegetation into cities. There's also other benefits like this. This is the same project that I show you left and right there. In summer, it's all dense, you know, foliant. Uh, vegetation, 
um, which helps to protect, uh, to shield the office space behind from high solar gain. You know, I, actually, I'm not even, I'm not sure if this is office or residential, but it's the same principle. It basically, it's thick vegetation. It's summer when the sun is intense, so the, the vegetation shades that sun. Instead of wasting more energy to put blinds on the outside of a glass facade that you didn't need to build out of all glass to begin with, um, and then in winter or fall, the, the vegetation starts to thin out, and it allows the sun through when it's cold and you want it. It's one of my favorite projects. Uh, it's about five years old. Uh, it's a twin tower residential scheme in Milan. It's called Bosco Verticale. That translates to vertical forest. And um, this is just a phenomenal project. Uh, in terms of every residential unit has its own little piece of forest, not just a few Mickey Mouse plants. I mean, this is significant trees. And to stand under that tower, which I did a few years ago and look up, is like no other site in the world. Yeah? So, and, and, and back to my criticism earlier about these all glass towers, these, you know, rectilinear box, all these silly icons. I mean, I would argue that the exp architectural expression of that tower speaks to the challenges of the age that we live in, which are predominantly climate, carbon, societal, pandemic type challenges. Now we, we see an, a, breathe, a, a living, breathing architecture, which is, to me, this is the age that we live in, not these you know, all glass rectilinear boxes from 70 years ago. So vegetation in cities, vegetation in buildings, vegetation in high rise buildings, let's just do it tomorrow. Let's just dictate it that all buildings need to introduce vegetation into their palette. By the way, it won't happen unless we do. And that's part of the problem in America is that we don't dictate anything. We can't dictate anything for some reason. So it doesn't happen because it's left to the, to the good nature of the owner developer well he ain't going to do it if it's not going to have a direct financial return so vegetation in cities is vitally important but what if we go a step further not just vegetation in buildings vegetables not just vegetation vegetables so this is a project in in, in japan which it's greenery on the outside and throughout the building but that greenery is productive it's vegetables, it's fruit and vegetables which are eaten inside the office tower. I mean, you walk into the lobby and there's a rice paddy there. And the skin of the building is harvested for, uh, you know, for, for, for produce. So it's doing all those things I told you, sequestering carbon, cleaning the atmosphere, psychological benefits, small habitat species, and it's productive. I mentioned before about this preoccupation we have of building buildings out of all glass skins which is still with us 70 years after the modern movement. By the way, if you ask most people, take them around Chicago and, and ask them, which are the favorite buildings? And I can almost guarantee they're gonna say buildings that have, that have got opacity that are built out of stone that are not necessarily all glass towers. You know, people have this connection back to older buildings, partly because of the materials that they were built out of, not just out of age, the age of them. So, so to me, it, it's crazy that we're still building these old glass towers, especially in places like the hot solar environments like the desert. And if we moved away from old glass and brought opacity back and solid materials, then it'd be a much better energy equation. We wouldn't have to waste all the energy that we put into making blinds to cover up the glass, but there'd be a chance for more expression. It's a project in Mexico City. I was there again a, you know, a few years ago. Just an absolutely sublime project. You might not like it aesthetically, but the reality is that in any building, including a tall building, you know, there are functions in that building, bathrooms, lift cores, MEP floors. They don't want glass. They don't need light. They don't want light. So this building was oriented. It had glass. The glass was open to the north direction where there's no direct sun. And where the, where the sun is intense, it's a predominantly, you know, solid skin. It's a project in Abu Dhabi that's an all glass tower, but it has a dynamic skin. And the best way to describe it is like an umbrella. And when the sun tracks around the building, the umbrella opens uh, and stops the sun hitting that glass. And then as the sun moves around again, it closes and allows the light and the view. Now, this has been another big movement in, 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 in architecture in the last 20 years and high rise architecture, double skin facades. 
Um, and the double skin facades are often used or, or you know, justified in terms of natural ventilation, um, moderating the inside and outdoor space. But I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced if it's not sensible to build a building out of all glass, one skin of all glass, I'm not convinced it's um, good to build it out of two skins of all glass. That seems like a waste of energy to me, waste of carbon. By the way, there's a project in Germany with a double skin facade. The double skin facade is six feet wide. You can lie down in it. You can lie, unused space at the edge of the building. Now, thankfully, that would never fly in America, yeah? I mean, but, because it's, it's commercially driven, but six feet wide. Okay, so let's say the concept of the double skin facade is valid for natural ventilation, for, you know, protection. Of, but here's a project in India. So we're not wasting energy to produce the blinds, and we're not wasting that space. It's a facade farm. So it brings back the vegetation that I talked about in this city before, and it brings it into that interstitial skin uh, at the edge of the building and makes it productive. So we're not wasting energy on the blinds, and, and the vegetation wants the sun. By the way, the people in that office space there on the left-hand side have that psychological connection, which has been proven to have major benefits in terms of productivity, employee productivity, retention rates, and um, reduced absenteeism. This is proven scientifically. Number two, oh no, it's not number two, M much more than number two, but communal space in buildings. This is something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, sky gardens, uh, 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 not just in residential buildings, but in all buildings. This was one of the first projects to do it. It's in, it's in Frankfurt, uh, British architect, uh, Lord Norman Foster. Commerce Bank, Tower in, Commerce, Bank, Bank, Commerce Bank Tower in the 1990s. Every single office worker in this building has access to a sky garden. Visual and direct use access to a sky garden. These sky gardens, you can see it on the left there, step around the building. So the use of sky gardens in, 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 in tall buildings is, is, in my view, vital. Um, oh, there, there's the sky garden. Um, now, the second tallest building in the world today is Shanghai Tower in Shanghai. It's 632 meters tall. By the way, if you don't know how tall that is, it's maybe... Uh, two-thirds of Sears Tower on top of two, uh, uh, Sears Tower, uh, so it's pretty tall. Now, the entire skin of that building is wrapped in 18 sky gardens. Now, this image was taken a few years ago, so the vegetation is not bedded in, but this is the idea of that double skin facade that I criticise largely, but now it's a garden. So the whole height of 632 uh, metres are these sky gardens, which are incredible. Okay, another concept, um, and, and again, I keep saying this, but I'm very passionate about this. I'm even more passionate about this because this was the subject of my PhD, which took me 12 years to get. Sky bridges. Introducing horizontal connection between vertical towers. Um, and this is a project in Singapore, actually, social housing, government-built social housing that is connected at three levels. Eight social housing towers, social high-rise connected at three levels such that we, we, we've created significant urban habitat in the sky. Running tracks, recreational spaces. Um, and then here's another project in Singapore, the interlace, which you can see, by the way, this is incredibly dense. And this is a tall building. You might not look at anything, this is a tall building, but this is probably, 40 stories tall, if you add it all up, 35 stories tall. But it's not just, now you can see what I'm talking about, it's not just this big slick box. What they've actually managed to do here, I mean, this image is incredible. They've put maybe 3,000 people living on a plot of land and recreated the original site area, the original green area, two or three times in the sky. It's incredible, no? Isn't this the way to achieve density? That gets me onto another of my pet peeves, which is about the roof of a tall building. You know, that last project, some of these projects I'm telling you, it's about the use of the roof. The roof is the most valuable space in a tall building. Um, it's best views, cleanest environment, 
Uh, it's open, so it's plantable, you know, vegetation, trees, all that kind of stuff. And most tall buildings with roofs, we fill it up with crap. Sorry, shouldn't say that. We fill it up with ridiculous stuff like water tanks and lift over run rooms and satellite dishes and all this stuff. Why do we do that? You know, here's a project in Hong Kong, which still has the lift over run rooms, um, but at least they're using the space, creating communal space there. And one of, again, another of my favorite projects, if you bring the idea of the roof and the sky bridge together, then you get a project like this, Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. I'm only showing you real projects here. You know, that's the 60th floor. Now, come on, I mean, that's just, in, you know? So what are we waiting for? What, what's the problem here? Are we waiting for Martians to come down and design our buildings better? Do we not have, well, we're clearly demonstrating that in certain parts of the world we can do it. Well, why can't we do it in other parts of the world? We're not waiting for technological developments. We're waiting for the ability to deliver bigger visions, you know, politically, economically, and socially. Um, so I, so um, I, want to I want to bring this together into a series of diagrams, which to me is how I think, you know, with my students about reconsidering the vertical city. So, so I want to take you back to that scenario of a city uh, that's seeing rapid population growth and urbanization. So first of all, let's, let's imagine this city. This is an existing city. Uh, one million people live there right now. It's predominantly a low-rise city. Um, there might be a couple of mid-rise buildings. But the thing I want you to concentrate on here is anything in colour. Because anything in colour signifies infrastructure. Back to that word, infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, I don't just mean roads, rail, power, lighting, water, sewage. I do mean all those things. Linear infrastructure. But by infrastructure, I also mean social infrastructure. I mean park, garden, sidewalk, doctor's surgery, school, shop, the stuff that we all need to live our lives, that support our existence. Now, in every city of the world, 100% of that infrastructure, 99% of that infrastructure and social infrastructure is at the ground floor. Some of it might be a little bit below or a little bit above but it's all at the ground plane. It's all at the ground plane, and that's what this, this, this diagram shows. Okay, so one million people over the next 20 years is going to 10 million people. Nine million more people are gonna go and live there. It's not science fiction. It's not science fiction. I can take you to cities right now where that's happened in the last 10, 15 years. So where do those nine million people go? Well, they can't go outwards because the reasons I described earlier, the loss of land, the consumption of land, and the energy to create that horizontal city, and then everyone commute in two hours. So there's only one way they can go up. So there's the solution. Absolutely not. Because every single one, those white boxes, every single white box there is either an office, a residential, a hotel, or some mix of those three things because that's what's happening in tall buildings. Well, what about the other stuff? So that's not the way forward. I think we need to start to think about tall buildings as a piece of that infrastructure-rich 2D plane flipped vertical with the infrastructure, with the garden, sky garden, with the schools, with the shops, with the doctor's surgeries, with the infrastructure. And then if we started to link that with bridges, connections, then we would get this vision of what we call sustainable vertical urbanism, which is this idea of um, connected 3D, multi-layered um, city. Now, you've all seen this before. I'll tell you where you've seen this before, in every single science fiction film of the future. You've all seen it. From Blade Runner onwards, you've all seen it. Why? Because to those people that are creating cities of the future, it seems silly to them that we would go to 100, 200, 300 stories and not bring in the horizontal. It seems stupid to them that we would go ever more vertical and not bring in the horizontal. But we're all stupid because that's what we're doing. 
You know, we need to bring in the horizontal. And, and although that might seem like a, a utopian vision from a professor in an ivory tower, and I admit that is the case, and I, you know, I mean, I, I see my job to agitate in this way, but is there any financial basis for that? Well, let me add this, because I think there is a financial basis. If we go back to the low-rise scenario, who pays for the sidewalk, the park, the sewage, the lighting, the power? Who pays for that? The government, out of taxes. Well, we just put nine million people more there paying taxes. The buildings themselves need to become public-private partnership, where it's not just a developer, to be quite frank, doing what the hell they want, you know, in terms of des designing a, a commercial box, but actually they might be designing a segment of the building and then there's government collaboration to finance the sky garden within it or the bridge to the next one and all these things. So, I, you know, I'm not stupid. I know that it's, it, it, it's, it's, it has challenges, but I've already shown you some projects that do that. Now, I've got one final section, uh, if, you, if you'll permit me. Am I, do, do I still have time? Am I okay? So that last set of diagrams was called uh, Rethinking the Vertical City or something like that, I can't remember exactly. Um, this next section is called Reconsidering the Resilient City. And if you don't think I'm crazy now, you will do in the next five minutes because this is a little bit more out there. And I, I don't want to be scaremongering, so I'm not, you know, but I just want to postulate and a vision, not a vision, a situation that perhaps might come true. I'm sure you all like me, you know, it's almost like there's a once in a 5,000 year event every day somewhere on the planet. How often do you hear that? Okay, it was a one in a 5,000 year storm. It was a one in a 50 year storm, you know. Climate change is absolutely real and it's impacting us. And every time I say that, more people nod in the audience because it's escalating. We all know it, yeah? Well, if you carry that to the next degree, most cities around the world that were founded hundreds and in some cases thousands of years ago, they were founded to a set of principles which did not take into account climate change. In fact, you know, they are probably in the worst place when it comes to climate change because maybe 65% of the largest cities around the world are on the coast. Um, so with my students a, a couple of years ago, we took this scenario where we asked ourselves, and this is, this is the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and what you're seeing there is you're seeing the entirety of, of the south tip of Manhattan the business district, downtown and midtown Manhattan, totally compromised for several days. Any buildings that have got lights there had their own kind of generators, but that building, those buildings were unusable for several days. Uh, and by the way, a similar thing happened a few weeks ago. You know, many, many buildings were flooded. And so the question that I put to my students is, are we ever going to see a time when, when existing cities become unviable, not unsustainable, unviable. Can we really make them resilient? And would we ever get to a point where, um, you know, if a Hurricane Sandy happened every, every day or every week and we couldn't prevent it, would we ever get to a point of saying, okay, existing cities, uh, a lot of them, are, they're done, they're done, we can't, we, they're just not viable and we need to create new cities, brand new cities, and then the very next question is, okay, well, if we do, where would we put them? And, 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 and the very next step to that is we'd put them in the most sustainable location. Well, what does that mean? And, and the biggest impact on sustainability, let me tell you right now, is location. It's not wind farms and solar panels and even vegetation, it's location. And we wondered whether humanity, at some point in the next 100, 200 years, would have to get strategic about where it locates humanity, where it actually locates. And, and so therefore, in principle, the most sustainable location, it just comes down to simple deductions. It would be somewhere where it doesn't get too hot in summer. You don't need energy to, 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 you know, to 
air condition all the spaces. Doesn't get too hot in summer, doesn't get too cold in winter, it's definitely not on the coast with a six meter um, uh, sea level rise predicted. Uh, it's probably not in an earthquake zone. Um, it's not in Hurricane Alley. Yeah. And so we started to look at the world and think if we had to get strategic, so we took, we took this vision of, of um, okay, United Nations Task Force 2100 and you, you all have, so we sent the students out um, uh, into different terrains around the world. And we said, if you had to start again with a city in, in, in this particular terrain, what would it become? In a, you know, in a, in, a, in a desert, in a mountainous area, in grasslands, in the middle of the ocean. And I wanna just give you a snapshot. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, to be honest, there's not a lot of detail there. I wanna just give you a snapshot of some of the visions that we came up with for cities, in the, cities of the future. You might be horrified. Um, so if you were designing in a mountain, mountainous area, um, the students here took the inspiration of the rock forms. So the city became this, like an extension of the mountains forward. And there's other, you, you'll see my earlier point about a harmony of the architecture and, and a materiality about the, the, you know, the architecture whole rather than these silly icons. It also had a rationale in terms of working with the height. So for example, the bottoms of the towers, lower down the mountains, had an alpine environment and the top were harvesting glaciers. And, and by the way, that's completely real. So the Burj Khalifa now, the Burj Khalifa is the tallest building in the world, 828 meters tall. Well, the external air temperature at the top of the Burj, just think about this for a second. The external air temperature at the top of the building on any given day is eight degrees cooler than the bottom. The moisture content in the air at the top of the building is radically different to the bottom. The amount of particulate in the air meaning sand and other stuff, is completely different at the top of the building than the bottom. Here's the thing. The climate at the top of the building is totally different to the bottom. So we've, I, I've talked a lot in this presentation about how buildings should be different depending on their climate, meaning in Africa or Asia or wherever. But now we're building buildings so tall that they cut across two or three climate zones just in themselves. So why the hell are they the same all the way up? The program's the same, the skin's the same, everything's the same. Um, so, so that idea of these, you know, this mountainous city, a different part of the building having a different responsibility, contributing to community and society in a different way, uh, is maybe not so far-fetched. What's the problem of building a city in the desert? Hot sun, too hot, no water. Well, actually, look at, look at this, uh, this, the inspiration of this wadi, the little oasis. So, so the students here built this uh, city because water does exist in the desert. It just exists at 500 meters and above in the cloud and the fog, and that could be harvested. So the students, you know, basically started the city at 500 meters and above uh, where they could harvest the water. Um, in the grasslands, this project was inspired by uh, termite mounds, which are some of the most environmentally efficient and, and clever structures in the whole world. So the buildings kind of echoed that. Remember this image? Remember this harmony and this kind of, no two buildings are the same, but there's a kind of something going on here. Um, hopefully you've seen that. The rainforest. You can't build in the rainforest. Of course you can't build in the rainforest, but there's so much of the rainforest that it was deforested that they managed to build a city in this deforested area in Brazil, in the Amazon, and, and use the city to repair that and bring, bring the, 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 the jungle into three dimensions. The sea, by the way, the sea, the middle of the ocean has the greatest energy generating potential any, of anywhere. Not every ocean, but in certain oceans because you've got almost unblocked solar energy, wind energy, and tidal energy. Yeah, so the three main engines that we're kind of, plus other ones that we're looking at. So could we build cities in the sea and, and, and make the most of, uh, of creating energy? There's some very big structures in the sea. Very big, like continent size or countryside oceans. So that's what this scheme did. You know, it, it looked, could we actually build cities in the ocean? Um, this was one of my favorites, the melting ice caps. Melting ice caps, you know, what can we do about it? I can't do anything, I can't do anything about it. You know, it's all melting. 
There's nothing we can, irreversible. It's increasing sea level rise, it's changing the temperature of the water, it's, it's just messing everything up. Or maybe we could. And this proposal built, a, built linear cities down to bedrock to basically, when the ice melted, it doesn't go into the sea. It's captured. So for the six months of the year where it's continual um, sunshine and daytime, you know, this is a little bit like the wall in the Game of Thrones, you know, this big wall that just goes for miles and miles and miles. So the ice melts because the city goes down to bedrock. It, can ca it captures that water before it gets in the sea. And it's water. And you can imagine people on jet skis and whatever, you know, in a kind of summer. And then when it comes into perpetual night, then the water freezes and that water is retained. So, you know, crazy ideas, maybe. But the point I'm saying is that we're not thinking on these levels at all about how, how cities can really address, you know, the challenges that we face. Um, so there's this view of the, the wall trapping, uh, trapping all this melting ice. So the final set of diagrams, what we did was, we, so we went back to this idea of having studied all this, which is the most existing sustainable locations. So we looked at the 224 cities of the world that had populations of 2 million. There they are. If you're a city of 2 million, you've got a red dot on that map. By the way, 45 of those are mega cities, meaning 10 million or more. Um, yeah, there you go with the orange thing. And then we looked at the, the, the risks to them. So from a, a, a risk of a six meter sea level rise, 51%, so I was wrong with whatever what statistic I said for, 51% of existing cities are really, really threatened by sea level rise. Hurricanes, 17%. Seismic hazards, we didn't necessarily take the most extreme, by the way, um, you know, it, we, Sorry, we didn't take a low level, we took extreme levels, you know. 20% um, of existing cities based in high seismic zones. Water stress, oh, don't even get me started. I mean, water stress. 38% of cities just don't have enough water, including many cities here in the US, by the way. Um, this temperature, are, are in very, very cold areas, 25% are also in very hot areas, meaning so much energy to cool them down, 48%. And then we put it all together and realize that we're totally got no chance on the planet. We put it all together, and if you, by the way, if you wanna go out and buy some land or real estate, take a picture of this diagram, and here's what was left. The most sustainable locations on this planet. Now, don't take a picture of this for obvious reasons, but, but by the way, that, I'll just give you the names in case you want to. You know, is, am, am I right? Are we right? This was me and 12 students working for a semester on this idea, you know? I, no, I, probably not. But the point I'm saying is that people are not thinking on this level of, of sustainability, social and community, about how we need to address it. Final point I want to make, and then I will be quiet. Um, we've talked a lot about Tolbert, and we've talked about a lot about the future and, and what's happening now. But I want to take you back and talk about tall buildings and longevity. So I want to ask a question. By the way, we're now building a tower in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, which will be one kilometer high. That, if you don't know how tall that is, it's, 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 it's almost two and a half times Sears Tower. One kilometer high. By the way, a height the equivalent of the Hancock Tower on top of it is totally unoccupied. We could talk about that uh, another time. Um, why are we building a tower that a third of it is unoccupied? But there's now there's going to be a building that's a kilometre high. Uh, I already told you there are 18. Maybe I didn't tell you this. There are 1,800 buildings over 200 metres tall. Oh, there you go. This is my sunflower. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what went on. I probably talked too long today. Okay, so we're building a building 1,000 meters high, a kilometer high in the, in the deserts of Saudi Arabia. There are 1,800 buildings greater than 200 meters tall, 686 feet. My question for you is, what is the tallest building that we have ever demolished? This does not include 9-11, positively demolished. The 
a Singer building. It was 187 meters tall and it was demolished in 1968. Actually, full disclosure, it's technically not true. There's another one that they took down, just finished a few months ago that was a little bit taller. But the point I'm saying is, we are building these buildings and they are gonna be with us for hundreds of years hundreds of years probably, and we have no concept of what different lives those buildings are gonna go through in terms of the external challenges from climate change, the internal challenges from the market, and we are not designing them more than, in some cases, a couple of years ahead, just soon enough that they can be sold and made a profit to somebody else. This is a problem. So community, sustainability, and skyscraper, can they coexist? Can they coexist? Absolutely but they're not really now. Okay, thank you.